So um, this evening, Tim is going to be speaking to us. But before he comes up to speak, um, I'm just going to do our reading, which is from John 20, verses 1 to 29. And it's going to come up on the screens, I think, as well. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Peter, Simon, came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the womb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where have you put him, and, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father had sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here, see my, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to them, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Right, I'm going to write up to him. Um, let's welcome Tim. Woo! Um, Tim, before you speak to us, thought it'd be good to get to know you a little bit. Well, what do you do? What's, what keeps you busy nine till five? Uh, I work for a tiny little fruit-themed tech company. Um, you might not have heard it before. I make the same joke every time. I do apologize. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and I hear that you're a cook. I, I am. Uh, okay. I cook a lot, yes. What's your yeah. favorite... If you could cook one meal for the rest of your life and eat it every single day, what would it be? I don't know, but um, recently we've been cooking a lot of duck. So Ooh. the other day we made a duck ragu. Um, that was pretty good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And how long have you been coming to St. Nick's? How are you? Yeah. Uh, year here? and a half. It'll be May. This year will be two years. Fantastic. Yeah. You need to preach it a few weeks ago. So yes, we're so excited yeah. to have you preaching again this evening. Thank you. Thank great. You. Over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm uh, going to pray for you. Sorry. Oh. Uh. 
the most important part of this whole thing. Great. Um, let's all just reach out a hand and pray for Tim as, um, as he preaches. Um, Jesus, we thank you for Tim. We thank you that you have called him to speak to us tonight. It is not a mistake that he is here. And Lord, we just pray that we are open to hear from, um, from you through him this evening. Pray you give him peace and everything that he needs right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you for that very long reading, Laura. Um, good evening, church. Um, how are you doing today? That's three more than this morning. Well done. Um, so I hope you're all well today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me already, um, if this is the first time we've met, I'm Tim. Um, I'm fa- part of the volunteer team um, here at St. Nick's. And, you know, as you've already heard, my, fa- my day job, I work for a tiny little fruit th- fruit themed tech company. And also I, I work as a photographer as a, on the side. Um, did a wedding yesterday that was really nice. Um, as we come out of our Lent and Easter preaching services, uh, preaching series, we thought we'd talk a little bit about post-Easter encounters. Because I don't know about you guys, um, I sometimes think about all this, all the build-up we have um, around Easter. And, you know, I've given up chocolate for Lent, and then, you know, I've done my community service on Good Friday, and then, you know, I've celebrated Jesus' resurrection on the Sunday, and then sort of, now what? I'm back at work. I've been back at work for a week. And unless you're a teacher, you know, then good on you, because um, well done for raising up the next generation. You've earned your holiday. I hope you've been on a holiday, uh, or on a holiday. But, you know, what now? What now? I've spent a a majority of my pre-adult years um, between Hong Kong and Singapore. And when I was a child, I've sort of grown to admit, you know, I really admire Japanese culture. And and I promise this bit is related. Um, I love Japanese food. I love Japanese cars, I love Jap- the Japanese way of thinking, I love Japanese craftsmanship. And in that part of the world, we see Japanese craftsmanship um, and engineering the same way we sort of talk about German engineering here. Um, I especially love this animated series called Gundam. You're going to see a photo here. Um, this year, this ongoing animated series sort of celebrated its 45th anniversary. And, and this is all about, you know, a future generation of humans that have sort of moved on to space. And then um, people are fighting wars between um, people on Earth and people at space, uh, using robots as their main tool of war. It really sort of tries to tell the tragic story of war. It's meant to be really anti-war. But, you know, when you're 10 years old, that's sort of all lost to me, because it's just really cool robots just shooting at each other. What's there not to like? Um, so around that time, my parents told me, do you know, Tim, when you turn 18, we're going to take you to Japan. We're going to eat all the Japanese food, and you can see all the Gundam exhibits. Best news ever. So, year 18 came. I finished my sick form exams, and guess what? We didn't go to Japan. Instead, my parents decided to go to court and get a divorce instead. Um, Probably not the best time to bring up a trip to Japan. What's worse was that I then moved back to the UK on my own for university and sort of settled in life in here. Um, which, which I am aware, moving across the world is a huge privilege. But, but don't let that stand in the way of a good story, because that's not the moral of the story I'm, story I'm trying to tell you here. In the five years since I've been back, uh, my mom and my siblings have then been to Japan three times. Three times. Can you believe it? I've waited all this time, and yet they got to go first, and then they got to go second, and then they got to go third. How is that fair? I finally made it to Japan year 12, uh, just so you guys know. Um, I wonder sometimes if we treat our encounters with God the same way as how I felt about not getting good to Japan when everyone else did. Maybe you've been to church for a while now, and maybe you're feeling a little bit left behind, asking, you know, why didn't or why can't I hear from God? Why can't I meet him the same way as all the other people have been talking about? Dare I say, maybe you're even feeling a little bit abandoned by God. What if I have doubts? I thought being a Christian or following God means I no longer have any doubts. Or perhaps today you're new to church and this whole God thing, wanting to discover faith for yourself, faith for yourself, but you don't really know how. You might be asking the question, how do I get to encounter God? Am I even good enough before I have that privilege? Whatever place you found yourself in today, in this spiritual journey, I hope today we can share something with you that will help you explore your personal encounters, your personal experiences with Jesus. And if you're taking notes today, I've named this, What If I Don't? So in the passage that Laura's, Lord, uh, Laura's read us, the very long passage, um, John 20, we see John's account of the immediate aftermath um, after Jesus' resurrection. 
This chapter contains a varying level of personal uh, uh, encounters by the followers of Jesus um, with the resurrected Christ. So I think it is worthwhile for us to break down this passage a little bit so that we can better understand um, how we interact with God. The passage starts with Mary going to visit Jesus' tomb early in the day on Easter Sunday, and when she sees the tomb have been altered with, she went to tell everyone else. And then everyone just sort of panics, and they start running around, and then they went to check out the tomb, and then they start panicking some more. This whole time, Mary stood outside the tomb, and she was weeping. Now, think about it. This is your friend we're talking about, and tomb raiding is considered extremely taboo, even today, and really disrespectful. So let alone 2,000 years ago. And then suddenly, this is where Jesus reveals himself to Mary. And then when Mary goes around and tells everyone else that Jesus is risen, they sort of went, huh? Are you sure? Until Jesus himself appears in front of the rest of them, except Thomas, who said, I won't believe until I can literally put my finger through the nail wounds on Jesus' hand, which is really specific. Um, Then Jesus appeared in front of him and said, here, Put your finger through my nail wounds. Then he said, along with everyone else, proving his resurrection, saying, you've all got to see me as I've resurrected, but there will be those who don't get to see me and still believe. Now, with our memories refreshed, I kind of want to talk about three things in this account that I find really interesting in understanding the dynamics of encountering God. Firstly, Mary sets off before dawn. In John 20, verse 1, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Whatever she was looking to achieve, the other gospels suggest that she might be there with burial spices to anoint Jesus' body. She was there before the busy of the day. From what I understand, it is not Jewish tradition to embalm a corpse with spices. And even then, the chapter before this mentions that Jesus' body had already been embalmed. So whatever reason she had, she was there to spend time with Jesus before the day got busy. And I think that was intentional. Just imagine this. It's it's been three days. It's three days after Jesus' crucifixion. And I remind you that the people voted for this. And they celebrated it. And the town was going to be really busy. And everyone will still be talking about Jesus' execution. You, on the other hand, you want to continue to pray, and even though he's dead, you know him to be the son of God, whose mere presence and even clothing that he was wearing could heal people. So why would Mary believe any different even when he's dead? To be close to his body could still mean that you still be close to the presence of God. So Mary went down to the town, went before the town got busy. She went before her own day got busy to spend time with Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself does this when he's praying to God. In Luke 5.16, in the New Living Translation of the Bible, it says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. He withdrew to the wilderness. And then in Luke 6.12, it says, one of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray, then spent the night praying to God. He went out of his way. And then again, in Luke 9, after predicting his own death, He did it again in verse 28. It says, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, James with him and went up to a mountain to pray. It seems like the the busier Jesus' life life got, the more we see Jesus being intentional about spending time with his Father. These are just some examples where Jesus deliberately goes to a quiet place, away from the hustle and bustle, to pray and connect to God. So, When we're feeling like we're not hearing from God, or that these encounters with Jesus that we hear about are just going by us, do we ourselves need to find a quiet place in order for us to meet God for ourselves? The second interesting point, I thought, um, was in John 20, 25, where Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, widely known as Doubting Thomas within Christian world, says, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nail were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. To us, it may seem a bit silly because we already know that Jesus has risen. He has resurrected. But just put yourself in Thomas's shoes here. He knew that Jesus was crucified, one of the most painful, and let's be honest, definitive way you can kill someone. He knew that the tomb was sealed, and you're just sort of telling him that this guy just floats out alive. Like, I remember when I was a child, if I didn't do my homework, right? I will be told off by my teachers. 
And I knew that. And guess what? I still didn't do my homework. Just because Thomas has seen Jesus perform miracles after miracles after miracles, it is still within our human natures, human nature to be a little bit doubtful. Especially if he was told the man he just saw, he just saw got killed is back alive again. So I don't think Thomas was widely being faithless here because of the little we know of him. Within biblical accounts, we know that he is fiercely and more importantly, courageously loyal to Jesus. Early in John eleven sixteen, 16, he was the first one to encourage the other disciples to follow Jesus back to Judea. After Lazarus' death, despite the threat of stoning made against Jesus and his followers at that time. So I think rather than simply doubting the truth, Thomas was asking for the truth. While Jesus ultimately said, blessed are those who will not have seen and yet have believed, he still leaves room for those who ask to, be, to see. In Matthew 7, 7 to 8, which was during Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, he said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks the door will be opened. When Jesus asked, sorry, when Thomas asked, Jesus showed up and said, put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out with your hand and put it into my sight. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas asked and, G and Thomas received. Thirdly, in John 20, 29, as we have already discussed, as Thomas finally acknowledges Jesus' resurrection, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have belief. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet are, have believed. Jesus points out that not everyone will have a direct encounter with God. Those who do have an encounter with God, why, why should we believe that they will be exactly the same as each, as each other's? Once again, the best place for us to examine this is, is in the Bible. So I did a little digging, and I found a few kinds. There's loads, but there's a few kinds of encounters with God. And, and this first one I'm going to talk about is what I call a fiery encounter. In Exodus 3, Moses discovers a bush that was on fire, yet not burning. Upon closer inspection, God then speaks to him through the burning bush. Then we have what we call, what I call, a dramatic encounter. In Acts 9, there was this guy called Paul. And Paul uh, wrote, actually wrote the majority of the New Testament. But before he became Paul, he was known as a guy called Saul, and his job was to prosecute Christians. He even enjoyed it so much that in, the, in verse 1 of Acts 9, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous th threats against the Lord's disciples. So this guy who likes killing Christians, he, he was on his way to Damascus to, kill, to, to prosecute even more Christians. And so suddenly, in verse 3 to 5, it says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replies. A beam of light directly flashed from heaven for Saul to encounter Jesus. I call that fairly dramatic. Now, then we have what, we, what I call the fairly anticlimactic um, encounter. In the book of Job, we see Job endures many suffering. He loses all his farm animals, then his servants, and then his children. At one point, his own death, his own health even starts to deteriorate um, in, in the sense that he starts developing boils all over himself. And then all his friends start doubting him and arguing with him in the midst of his pain and his anguish. And finally, after all that, after 38 chapters into the book of Job, God just sort of starts talking to Job through a storm. A storm. Come on. We'll have those twice a day here in Bristol. Job didn't encounter God through something supernatural like the ever-burning bush or a beam of light from heaven, but through just some weather. Now, you might not have directly encountered God at all, at least not in the sort of in-your-face encounter that we've just talked about. It doesn't mean God isn't in you and isn't working through you. For example, there isn't a single mention of God specifically talking to Esther in the entire book of Esther, and yet God was still able to work through Esther. She was still able to withstand evil and save all of God's people from persecution. I would love to tell you today that if you did X, Y, and Z, you'll be definitively and directly being able to encounter God. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the Bible is clear. Some of us may never directly encounter God in the in-your-face the, in sort of way. 
if we do encounter God, our encounters with God can be vastly different from each other. So you might be thinking now, oh, well, if I can't guarantee an encounter, you know, what's the point of all this? But, but I want to encourage, I want to encourage us that like Esther, even without personally directly encountering God, God will still flow through and work through us, bless us and guide us. So we should absolutely do everything in our power to draw ourselves closer to God. I've given you three things I found interesting within the passage. So you kind of guessed it. I have three things for you that I think are going to be useful to draw closer to God. Firstly, like Mary and Jesus did, we need to find our own rhythm spending time with God. For Mary, and often Jesus, it was to go away from the busyness of life, either by physically going farther away like to a mountaintop or in the early hours of the day. Whatever we look like, whatever it looked like, we all need to find our own rhythm of God. For me, I love waking up early. Around the turn of the year, I start picking up running and in, in the morning between six or seven. I like that it helps me clear my mind before the start of the day and focus on my own breathing. I can just talk to God. But, you know, I can also hear you. Tim, you're not married. You don't have kids. Of course, it's easy for you to say. To say to wake up early and to pray and read the Bible. And you're right. Or maybe you're saying, Tim, you don't understand. I have 40 hours of lecture this week and I have to, readings to do, and I have to write a dissertation. Yeah, I don't have those things either. But what I do know is that intentionality, in whatever way that works for you, is important. Perhaps that bit of time that you have with yourself between dropping off your kids at school and arriving at work, or maybe the five minutes you have before you go to bed. One time I even just went to the toilet to pray at work between two very um, difficult customers. Being inten intentional allows us to give space for God to occupy in our lives. You know, God is omnipresent, which means he's going to be everywhere. But we, we have to do the work too. We need to leave space for him in our lives in order for us to be receptive of his presence. If you don't know how to pray, later there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask for prayer. Maybe let that be a step one in your prayer, in your journey to ask. Maybe let that be a step for you to start a prayer. Or if you don't have the physical space, maybe, maybe just book a slot in our 24-7 prayer room to have this space away from the busy of your own life to pray and invite God in. Secondly, like Thomas, we need to ask. The English poet William Cowper wrote this, God moves in a mysterious way. We don't know how he's going to show up in our lives, so sometimes we have to ask. Asking is no bad thing. In the Lord's Prayer, the very prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, we ask for five things. For daily sustenance, for forgiveness, for the ability to forgive, for us to be led away from temptation, and for us to be delivered from evil. So why are we not asking an encounter from God? When we do ask, and he does answer, do we even know that he's speaking if we don't know the language that he's speaking to us in? The best way to get started in knowing his language is through the Bible. Maybe you find it hard to ask. Maybe at one point in your life, you've asked and nothing's really happened. And how do I even get started on the Bible? We'll soon resume our Tuesday hubs and, uh, and homes, communities. So if you don't have one already, I want to really encourage you to connect with one of our team today so that we can set you up with one. Because I believe, I believe that there is strength, there's power in the strength in numbers where we can ask others to ask for us, ask with us, and we can explore the Bible in a safe and smaller environment. Thirdly, we need to stop comparing our encounters or the lack of, encounter, lack of direct encounters because everyone has a different journey. When I was at university, the first decision, I, 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 when I was at university, I made a decision um, as an adult for the first time to follow, follow God. I was living with a few other people at that time who are now some of my best friends um, a decade on. We all sort of did my home church's leadership development year, and we all wanted to work professionally in the ministry. I wanted to work for church so bad. Eventually, one of us, Sam, he was hired by church really early on and became creative director at church and is now working towards becoming ordained as a certified pastor. Another one of us, Scott, um, who was also very early on appointed youth pastor in what became one of the largest youth movements in Norwich. He then moved to London and is now a PhD in childhood psychology. And then there was Andy. 
Andy, who also became staff and became one of the key preachers in the life of that church. And then there was me, who never really got appointed to anything for a long time. And I was working still for the fruit company then and now, and I felt tiny, tiny amongst titans of the faith. There were times where I felt like, you know, what's the point in even trying because there were these super anointed people and then there was me. But one day at work, a colleague who knew I was Christian, because I always just sort of shared photos on my social media, she asked me about God and why Christians were so against people like her. So we started chatting. Then one day she was asking if she could come to church with me. So she did. Then one day something came up in her life and she asked if I could pray for her. So I did. Imagine if I had given up on my faith. I would never have had the opportunity to chat with this person. This person whose society and some sects of Christianity has said that she's not welcome in God's house. To take this person to church and to pray for her. I'm going to invite Matt up now to pray as we to start playing, as we start to reflect. I'm not telling you all this because I'm bragging to you that I managed to invite someone to church. Far from it. I'm telling you that that day I realized this one thing. The one thing God has positioned me outside of all these big Christian jobs. Instead, I had the opportunity to do something for my friend, being there for her as she encountered God. That was bigger than any full-time ministry that I could take on. My best mate Sam and Andy and Scott were exactly where they needed to be in their journey with God, and I was exactly where I and my friend needed to be in our journey with God. We need to stop comparing our relationship and encounter with God with others. I don't know where you are when it comes to your relationship with God. Maybe you've had one for a while and it's kind of running dry. You faintly remember what it's like to encounter God and you, you're yearning for it again. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God, with this Jesus that we've been talking about. And you're kind of curious. I know for me, I can put in a lot more work myself into my relationship with, with God because mine is far from perfect. But I do know this. We can all, all of us, could use some more drawing closer to God because even though I, and I also know, it's difficult in the midst of the busy and the noise of our daily lives, so we need to be intentional. As I draw to a conclusion today, I want us to look at one last passage, and it's this. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. The passage doesn't say, For God so loved the ones with the fiery encounter, or the ones with the obvious encounters. It says, For God so loved the world, and whoever who believes. This means you and me and everyone else, regardless of how we encountered God. We may not encounter him in the way other, people's, other people might, but we are here to run our own race of God and only ours. We might not be where we want to be, but thank God we are not where we used to be. So let's focus on our own race, our own encounters, no matter how loud or dramatic or quiet they might be for us, his love is there for us in abundance. I want to encourage us. All we need to do is to be intentional and God will do the rest. Thank you.